So this topic is going to be about security um, in history, and we're going to look at basic ciphers that have existed. So this is really kind of going to be from everything up to World War II. Um, to give you a framing for, you know, this course is about computer security, but we've had security in the past, right? We've dealt with security systems for a long time. There's a lot of history in our cryptographic and security methods. Um, so it's good to understand that to really see where we're coming from. So unfortunately, all of crypto and security, really in history at least, dealt with war, dealt with securely moving messages, um, mostly for like battle purposes uh, and things like that. So the history of all of these ciphers, all of the security is very tied up um, with the history of nations of war. And most of them were military secrets, uh, at least originally. Right, so we know a lot more about them now, um, but there's even some stuff still from you know World War II uh, that that isn't uh, publicly released fully. So, um, so there's quite a bit that's tied into this history of war. Um, so one of the earliest, there, there's kind of a few when we start talking uh, very early ciphers, it gets a little trickier uh, because you know there's obviously not um, things recorded as well. Um, this lecture probably will have a little more Western focus because that's what um, is known in sort of more directly by, by what I've worked with, by what um, comes out in our literature. Uh, but like everything in history, it's, it's extremely vague, um, the timelines of who is doing what when. So I'm just going to explain a few historical ciphers um, that, you know, have existed in the past and sort of show you the, the issues with them and why we've moved to more advanced ciphers. All right, so here's a really basic one. If you've got something like a strip of paper, see, this is one you can play along with. What you can see is it's wrapped around, um, you know, there's, there's a, a cylinder here and there's something wrapped around it. And the idea is that you write a message across here and then you unwrap the paper um, and when you do that you basically have the diameter of whatever rod you're using becomes like how it encrypts it so so the message you need the same diameter rod to to recover the message so if i do a little demo here for you um, we just you know wrap this around like this right so you can see hopefully let's see if this focuses um, there's a message and all we would do is if I write a message across, and you could try to get one character on each zone, right? So if I say, hello, and then I'll go to the next line, how are you, I'll just put a TM one to finish it off. But um, what you can see is there's gonna be some message here, right? that you could kind of read off that, right? Hi, hello, how are you? And I was gonna say today, but it just stops. Um, so it's just written across, right? Um, and, and stuff like that. So when we remove it from this, what you see is that um, if you look down, right, it's not quite as obvious. Um, obviously this isn't super secure because there's only so many di diameters uh, that this would fit on and it becomes kind of obvious that that's the format. The format of the, the message itself makes it really obvious, um, so you'd have to move it on to some other uh, paper. Okay, so another really common one that you might come across is something called uh, a Caesar cipher or Caesar shift. Um, all this is, is a, um, a really basic way of shifting an alphabet over. So all you do is you substitute, right? So A, in this case, it's a, a shift of three, so D, in, in this case, the shift left becomes A, E becomes B, et cetera, et cetera. So you can, you can use that to, to encode and decode a message. Um, right, so uh, a variant of that is called rotate by 13 or rot 13. Um, is the exact same thing, just with a shift of 13 characters over. Uh, you might see this kind of frequently, or it used to be frequently used in like forms and stuff like that to encode like um, spoilers if you were discussing, say, movies or... Um, things like that. And the idea is it's pretty easy to do in the field um, or by hand or something like that. You have a decoding key. So for example, if I want to encode hello, um, I would look H up and say H becomes U, um, E becomes R, L becomes Y, L becomes Y, and O, where's O? O becomes B. 
Um, and you can see it, it, it saves a bit of space by having both uh, there and you, you can go from one way to the other. Um, but that's a, a really you know basic cipher and you might say like, hey, that's, that's silly. Surely no one uses that in real life. Um, but you'd actually, uh, you'd be surprised. So it's been used as a number of examples and it's ended up in some actual uh, implementations and software. So there's a relatively famous case, um, someone, so he had a company, Soft, that was dealing with ebook security. Um, and they basically found that one of the um, ebook producers was using some default code from Adobe that actually used uh, ROT13 as the encryption mechanism. Um, so the, he, Dimitri here, the photo of him for you, um, gave a presentation at, at a conference, DEF CON, and he basically showed that like, oh, this, you know, is real, not very secure. Um, with obviously with this rotation, we can pretty easily guess what the rotation is. Um, and, but it didn't work out so well for him. So he ended up uh, getting arrested and stuff like that because it was an early example of breaking computer security, regardless of, of how, you know, not great the security was um and yeah so the and it was eventually dropped and stuff like that but you'd be surprised all this stuff ends up you know existing in a lot more cases than you anticipate all right so if we look back to to this these rotational ciphers why are they so bad they're so bad because the english language is not uniform so if we assume it's written in a language so let's say english but you could do this for other languages too certain letters are way more frequent Right, so E, for example, is a lot more frequent um, than Q. So if you look at a message, uh, if it's a long, long enough message, right? So if someone's encrypted quite a bit of data, um, you could actually build this same graph, right? So if you analyze a bunch of ciphertext and see, ah, well, there's um, like let's say we don't know what these are, right? But let's say what's the most frequent letter? Let's say the most frequent letter is Z in the the ciphertext that you have. Well, that doesn't make sense if it's English. Um, probably it's a substitution cipher where Z maps to E and so forth. And, and then obviously there's more. If it's not a simple shift, there could be other work you do to, to figure it out. But um, all of these ciphers, the fundamental problem, and this is what we're going to look at with more advanced ciphers, is that they're extremely easy to analyze statistically. Um, and so much so right, that we could use a, a website, so I'll leave this here, um, and you can get the, the PDF version of the slide so you can copy this stuff out. Um, but if you go to this website and insert this, it should actually be able to, to decode. So I've used a Caesar cipher to encode something. Um, you should be able to decode this. So it's just basically all it does is it tries all possible permutations of the shift. Um, and then looks for what's the most likely, like what has some English words in it and stuff like that. So, and it ranks that as that, this is probably the most likely one. Um, but you can see from this, you know, these things are, are pretty easy to break um, in, in sort of real life. So there is a theoretically unbreakable method of security. Um, and this uses what's known as a code book. So on the left here, um, this is a photo of an actual code book. And what you basically have is you have like a random word that's assigned to another word or another letter. Um, so you have a book that says, you know, when I say dog, it means um, something about, you know, some number, wh whatever it is. So there's some tra translation and it's totally arbitrary, right? So there's no statistics. There's nothing that we can apply um, if we don't have the code book. The other assumption here is that if a message is only used once, right? So if we start to reuse this code book a ton of times, uh, it might become tricky because we might be able to infer some stuff about messages by saying, well, we have an encrypted message. Um, after they sent this message, you know, um, a gun was fired or something happened or they attacked somewhere. Um, so you can guess that something in that message, you know, means attack or something like that. So, so it's, not totally unbreakable in practice, right? So we're, we're gonna delve a lot more into practice versus theory of this stuff. Um, but the point is that, you know, it, it is possible to achieve really good security, even with these old systems. All right, so the issue with it is that we need a secure channel for the codebook. We have a physical codebook we need to give to people. Uh, you might need to update them, right? So if a codebook is captured, the problem is now someone can decode that. So that's not great. Uh, and if it's like a submarine or something, it's very difficult to update these, you know, in real life. 
Um, lots of examples of this failing. So uh, a pretty famous one, um, let me move myself, is this uh, U-110 capture. Um, so U-110 was a German U-boat. Uh, and in this U-boat, it had actually several, several pieces of, of uh, interest here. So there was a code book that broke uh, this short signaling system. So there's a photo of the code book there. It helped them break this other uh, handwritten, they call it, uh, code break system. And it also had an Enigma machine, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. Um, but the point is that the, the physical security mechanisms uh, allowed this to, to, to fall into place. And um, one thing that was kind of crazy with this, this capture actually, is that if you look at when they went into the U-boat to, to, to get the stuff out, you know, it wasn't necessarily obvious like, oh, this is a code book. It doesn't say on it in code book. Um, you know, it might look a little like something suspect, but basically the, uh, the Germans, they tried to scuttle the boat. Um, it was captured. The scuttling didn't work. So they tried to sink it right, by scuttling it so that all this stuff wouldn't fall into the enemy hands. Um, that didn't work for whatever reason, so uh, they went on it to grab anything of importance. And basically, uh, the person that was doing the boarding, there's a, a little quote I have here that says, you know, they just thought it looked out of place. They just took it as they didn't know what it was, but uh, they looked weird, so let's just grab that. Maybe it's good. So that turned out to be really critical, right? And in fact, be, when the boat was being towed back, um, it sank and route. So maybe they could have recovered it or they did, but the point is that by having it up front, it saved a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of effort. All right, so here's a, uh, an example of real code books, you know, in use that you, you can use them securely, um, is this thing called number station. So there's a whole bunch of them out there. Uh, they basically transmit messages in the clear to everyone. So you have a powerful broadcaster that sends a message and it sends it to countries at a time. Um, so there's a really famous one, uh, UVB76 it's called. Um, and this is a Russian shortwave station. So it, it can be heard pretty far around Europe effectively. Um, and it just, tra it can send, you know, these, these, uh, numbers, words that mean nothing to anyone, right? And it's not clear who it's even intended for because it's just widely broadcast. If you had the code book, you could decode it and there could be unique code books for every agent. Um, so this is one of the reasons it's still used. It's incredibly powerful. It has the disadvantage to gain of a physical code book, um, but normally there's always some physical aspect to, to everything. So I have an example uh, link there. Um, I'll just play it for you. So this is, uh, you know, most of the time, what you have is a buzzer or beep that just keeps running. Um, this has been going since 1973. So the other cool thing is this is a very long running station. Um, occasionally we get sequences like this. So it's in Russian, of course. Um, so that was uh, one from the, the recent August 24th transmission. So, so this is all very recent stuff that you can uh, check out. And you can actually listen to it live. So the other link here um, will play the, uh, the live view of it. So I'll, I'll play normally what it sounds like. Um, see if... So you can just hear that buzzing going on and off. So that's the sort of alive and stuff of other people from using the, the frequency. Um, so, so these things exist and you can, you can kind of look quite a bit at it, but because someone needs the code book to understand that there's no, right. You can't actually solve this, um, this problem easily. Yeah. So that's a, a really quick overview of historical ciphers. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about computer security, it's good to know where we're coming from. Um, the important thing here is, right, it's, it's often based on substitutions and code books and stuff like that. Um, so it, it's pretty easy to break them with computers if we do like that analysis. Um, so if you check out the Decode website, it's got a pretty cool example of that. Uh, luckily, the computers didn't exist when they were in use. 
but it's even possible to, to solve them with human, you know, or very basic um, computations and stuff like that. So they're, they're fundamentally not very secure. Uh, the next thing we'll look at is another uh, cipher system uh, called Enigma. Um, and it basically still had some of these issues about the, the, the captured, right? So once something was captured, the system could kind of be lost, but it made it a lot more recoverable. So you didn't need to send a whole new code book. You just sent some, some special settings and people in the field could change to that. Um, so that was sort of the beginning of the, of the first real crypto systems um, and is kind of a really good background before we dive into more about our, our interest in fundamentals of real computer security.